This camera, again, perfect for car mounted work. We all know I'm a Blackmagic fanboy at heart. I constantly profess my love for the original Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera and even filmed a feature film on one. It packs a powerful punch at a great price. It's a fantastic camera. And for such an old camera, it really holds its own against some of today's best stuff. But what about this guy? It's little brother, the Blackmagic Micro Cinema Camera. There are a lot of great things about this camera and a lot of not so great things. So today I'm gonna to dive into the ins and outs of this to help you decide if the BMM CC is worth spending your hard earned dollars on. I'm Will Von Toggen. If you like what you see here, be sure to hit like, share, and subscribe. And with that, let's get going. Now I gotta be honest with you, I never really liked this camera when I first owned it in 2016. I really wanted to and I was really excited when it came out, but it just didn't do it for me. Now don't get me wrong, it's still a nice quality camera and makes great images. It features the same Fairchild sensor found in the OG and the 2.5K Blackmagics and shoots both DNG RAW as well as early forms of compressed RAW, not B-RAW and ProRes. Now the main reason people seem drawn to this little guy is its abilities to overcrank to 60p RAW. That means slow motion and the tiny low profile form factor allowed it to be used in ways similar to the Pocket OG. Now when it was first released in 2016, drone use was on the rise, especially the larger models that were designed to carry external cameras as opposed to what DJI focuses on now with its all-in-one units. And this little guy seemed like the ideal camera to slap onto one of those big six or eight rotor drones. At least this is a feature that Blackmagic seemed to really push along with its obvious potential as an action cam to possibly compete with GoPro. Now there was a second version of this, the Micro Studio Camera, which boasted 4K capture capabilities. That is a big deal in 2016. It had mini SDI connectors along with HDMI, but it has no internal recording capabilities. Now I won't talk too much about that camera. It was largely designed for studio use, slapping it on a studio jib, or you'll even see it in use still at live stream events such as eSport tournaments. Now I haven't used it, it wasn't really designed for narrative production. However, if you are considering one of these micro cameras, I would advise getting the cinema version over the production version. Yes, the production version does do 4K, but not 60 frames in 4K. And I think the internal recording capability is much more important here on the cinema model. Now, as I said, Based on the size, modular build design, and the way in which Blackmagic marketed this camera, it's clear that it was intended to be used as more of an action camera, to be mounted and used like a GoPro, but with much higher image quality. Now personally, and I'll expand on this in a minute, I don't think this camera was ever really designed to truly be used as a standalone production camera. It thrives as an action camera, but some of my biggest issues with the BMM CC come from the design, which make it much more optimal as an action camera. So let's get some of the nitty gritty out of the way. As is, it's an extremely small and lightweight camera coming in at 11 ounces. That's 300 grams for my metric friends out there. The mount is micro four thirds, which I love. That's great for adapting pretty much any lens to the body and allows you the use of speed boosters if needed. The sensor is super 16 millimeter in size, just like the Pocket OG, meaning it's a 2.88 times crop factor. Now that's not a big deal for me. There are plenty of ways to get wide angle shots with this. You just need to plan a little with your glass. Now one of my favorite Micro Four Thirds lenses, the Panasonic 12 to 35, is a perfect pairing with this camera and it will get you a great range in just about any shooting situation. But remember, if this is still an issue, the Micro Four Thirds means you can use a speed booster to get a little bit more range out of some of the other glass that you may have in your existing catalog. Now, I personally really like the Super 16 sensor look. It's a lot easier to keep life in focus, but if you're one of those filmmakers who thinks shallow depth of field and bokeh is all there is to creating a cinematic image, Please check out my earlier video on creating a cinematic image. You'll see that bokeh is actually very low on the list of things that impact that. And if you pay attention to most movies, you'll be amazed how rarely a super shallow depth of field is actually used. DNG RAW, compressed RAW, and various levels of ProRes all recorded internally to SD cards. That's awesome. 
Now there's no B-RAW, so you can't edit the raw footage directly in Premiere, but it is possible in DaVinci to edit it natively or just spit out some proxies to edit in your program of choice. Obviously you can always shoot ProRes and edit that anywhere, but if you follow this channel, you know that I believe if you can shoot raw, you should always shoot raw. 1080p HD only in this model. As I said, the studio camera can do 4K up to 30 frames a second, but it only records externally. And remember that 4K isn't everything. HD is still a popular format, and you can always do a final export up res to 4K if needed for your delivery. Dynamic range, about the same as the pocket pretty much, about 13 stops in DNG RAW, which is plenty. Honestly, if you can't get usable footage within that range, I think you might have other problems with your filming technique. If you do blow out your highlights, DaVinci has a great instant highlight recovery option to help you out, but 13 stops is pretty impressive for a camera of this age. Now the batteries are Canon LPE6 batteries. Awesome. So much better than the Nikon batteries of the OG. Much more common and much stronger. And you know what? In a Blackmagic First, this battery actually powers the camera to a usable degree. More on that in a minute. For ISO, you've got 200, 400, 800, and 1600, also plenty. Maybe a bit restrictive for people who have gotten used to the Pocket 4K and other cameras on today's market, but definitely enough ISO to get the job done. Now, a big question for some of you. Is this a low light camera? Well, again, if you've seen my other videos, you know my stance on this topic, but I'll say it again for the ones in the back. I think it's ridiculous to expect a camera to see in the dark. This camera works just fine in low light, but you need to understand that black is black and night is night. And if you need more, just light accordingly. The noise pattern in this camera is very organic, very pleasant to look at. And you know, in a world where everyone wants to get that film look, find me a film stock faster than 1600 that still looks decent. I have no problem with how this camera works in low light. I don't think you should either. Lots of ways to connect this camera with this. More on that in a second. And finally, the key selling point for most of you, 60 frames per second in RAW. Albeit compressed RAW, three to one, but still RAW. Now, of the other Blackmagic legacy cameras I've talked about so far on this channel, this is a first. And beyond the Ursa, it's the first compact camera from Blackmagic that can overcrank. And the fact that it does so in RAW is pretty incredible. So. Is this a good camera and something you should consider buying this day and age? Well, that's difficult to say. This camera has its strengths and it has its weaknesses and I'm going to be blunt. I don't like this camera for a lot of reasons. The thing I hate the most about this camera is the menu navigation system. Now where most cameras have a screen and the means to navigate the menu via sort of a cross button system like on the Pocket OG, or even better, a touch screen like the 2.5K and the 4K, the Micro uses this weird combination of the playback buttons to navigate in sort of a line pattern. And it sucks, and it's something I never got used to even after months of using it. Lack of screen aside, we'll get to that in a minute, there's nothing intuitive about navigating the menu in this method. Now with that, I'm constantly hitting the wrong button, navigating backwards, exiting out of the menu, the buttons are also very flush with the body and it's very easy to think you pressed one without actually pressing it. Now this is especially annoying if you have it mounted for action use, like on a car, you've already pulled the screen away, hit record, and then suddenly wonder if you really hit record because the buttons don't actually feel like they were pressed. Now there's a tally light you can turn on. It was put in here exactly for that reason, I think, but if you're like me, you don't always want the world to know every time you hit record. And because of the menu navigation issue I just mentioned, it's not really something you wanna always be turning off and on. Now maybe you'll get the hang of it and find a way to make quick use of it. I never did. I'm not stupid, it just never worked. And for me, that was always the biggest issue I had in owning this camera. The second thing about this camera that I don't really care for is something that maybe several of you will actually see as a positive, but for me, not so much. It's the modular nature of this camera. Now, I see a lot of comments on YouTube from people who were dying for Blackmagic to release a larger modular camera like RED, where it's essentially just a brain box with a sensor and all the appendages needed to make it work have to be built on. This seemed to be a big ask from people when the 6K Pro was announced. And that's pretty much what this is, but in the 1080p Super 16 sensor world. Essentially, this camera cannot really be used well as a standalone. It requires a build to get any real use from it. Look, I love the OG 
and the 4K and even the 2.5K because in a pinch, I can grab it and go. I can film in a very non-intrusive way. I can be gorilla and still get very high quality footage. I can shoot anywhere and draw very little attention to myself. For the Blackmagic Micro, this is about as stripped down as you can go and still hope to get usable footage. This is it. Grips, which are a must to keep the camera steady and off its roll access. Monitor, couple of batteries. Compare that to the most stripped down version of the OG or even the 4K. And I mean, maybe I'm crazy. And you know what, this isn't the most miserable way to shoot. It's actually, yeah, it's kind of nice and it's probably optimal compared to this stripped down version. But this is as low as you can go unless you're using it as an action camera. And I'm just not a fan. Third thing I hate, strong word, but I'm gonna use it anyway. And this falls in line with the modular nature of this camera are the connectors and this giant dreadlock tentacle, I don't know. This solution for adding connections, again, takes everything away from the low profile potential of this camera. Now this makes sense to me on the studio version where it might live on a jib and you need remote control of the camera. But for this camera, I can't stand it. Now included, of course, you've got connections for power source, audio, LANK, uh, different other programmable wires, but it's just too much. Now it plugs into the side right here, sort of like you know the old tower computer systems lives off to the side. Now, fortunately for external power, if the onboard batteries aren't cutting it for this, you can opt out of this cable by plugging into the battery port on the back with one of these adapters, runs out through a P-tap, but unfortunately this now requires you to use a V-mount battery, further expanding the size of this camera. Now this is a great solution. It does power the camera all day, will power your monitor, and I will agree most of the times that I'm shooting, this is what I would want to do. But as I just said, I want the option of shooting this more stripped down than what this is right now. Next is the image quality, and this one's on me, and maybe I'm the only one who sees it, but I do not believe this to look as good as the OG or the 2.5K. Even though they supposedly have the same sensor, the footage is clean, it's clear, it's high quality, but there's just something about the motion that looks much more video-like to my eyes. Now this is not very scientific, obviously, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time trying to dissect it. It might be purely personal preference and opinion, but after months of using this camera, the look is just something I was never quite able to unsee. All right, enough dumping on this camera. Yes, she's an ex, but we can still be friends. So what are some good things about it and what are the most useful aspects of owning one? Well, first off is the full-size HDMI port, awesome. Awesome, that takes care of the biggest weakness of the OG, which was port failure on the micro HDMI connection, which basically rendered that camera useless on larger productions where a monitor would be needed. Now this is a strong, sturdy connection, not as good as SDI, which is featured on the 2.5K, but it is much more accessible to the average consumer who might not have an SDI input monitor. So nice job, Blackmagic. Next is the 60p RAW. Now, I personally am not a fan of overcranking or slow motion. I think it's overused and a bit of a cop-out. However, I do understand its use and I know that a lot of viewers need this function if they do a lot of wedding videos or corporate B-roll. And this camera does it very, very well. Now, the next great thing is the native onboard battery option, which is worlds better than the OG and even the 4K. Now, while shooting footage for this review, I found myself getting about one minute per percentage of battery on average, which is not bad for a Blackmagic camera. Now, I never ran a battery into the ground, so to speak, but I can confidently say that with one Canon battery, you'll easily get over an hour of runtime, likely more, and that is huge. Now, that's Canon brand. I can't verify if off-brand batteries are as reliable, but if you have a few of these lying around and are gonna shoot stripped down, you can definitely get a day's worth of use on this guy, as opposed to like, what? an hour total on the OG or the 4K. So well played black magic. Also it's battery access point is much easier to access if you have the camera mounted to something. There's no need to deal with a battery door that might be blocked due to how the camera is placed. And this coupled with the overall runtime of a single battery makes the micro a great candidate for drone and gimbal use where swapping batteries can be a real pain. Also with regards to gimbal use, it's very well balanced and lightweight. You can easily gimbal this bad boy all day long with just about any gimbal on the market. Now the two best uses I've found for this camera are car mounting and product photography. This camera, again, originally made to be an action camera, is perfect for car mounted work. 
take a look. Obviously you can achieve this with the OG as well, but given the fragility of the screen and how useless that camera can become if the screen is broken, this is just a much safer and better camera for doing this type of work. Now one of the easiest ways to get these types of shots is with a suction cup mount like this. These are great. They're inexpensive, easy to use, easy to adjust, and especially when paired with a ball mount, and most important, they're reliable. Now another great use for this camera, which I really wasn't expecting, it's surprisingly good for tabletop and product photography work. I recently used this as a B-cam for a shoot I had with Asus computers, and most of the close-up product shots were done with this camera. Now, when you're doing close-up and macro photography on products, you need a lot of light so that you can stop down the lens to keep more of the product in focus for your close-ups. Now, the size of this camera when coupled with this little lens, more on that in a minute, lend themselves to this type of work because the risk of casting a shadow on the product is significantly minimized. Now this lens that I just mentioned, it's one of my favorite lenses for Micro Four Thirds work. It's the Laowa 9mm 0D. The 0D means no distortion, which refers to that bend you often see on the edges of a wide angle lens. Now it's fully manual, opens up to 2.8. It's extremely compact, very close focal length. I used it for both the car footage you saw as well as the product photography. The 9mm focal length yields a 25mm full frame equivalent. Now that's not super wide, but for a super 16 sensor, that's pretty dang good. Now, as with the Pocket OG, most new memory cards do not work with this camera, which is weird since you can technically still buy it new in a lot of places. However, all the cards that will work in the OG will work with the Micro. Now there are links in the description below for cards that will work with this camera, as well as a video overview of the cards. I'll say this though, your best bet if you want to keep yourself covered with this and other Blackmagic cameras, including the OG, are the Kingston Canvas Select Plus cards. There's a link in the description. They're very affordable. You can get them in the 128, 256, or even 512 gigabyte cards. Which one's right for you? You pick, but 512 gigabytes will get you over two hours of footage shooting in RAW. So definitely plenty of options for media, but keep that in mind. If you decide to buy this camera, you'll probably need to go buy some new cards for it, unless you're coming from the OG and already have a stock of cards that you know will work. But if not, you're definitely covered. To wrap things up, it's true. I don't like this camera, but there are some really cool uses for it. And so believe it or not, I do plan on keeping it. Now I'm still much more likely to grab my 4K or OG, probably just about any other Blackmagic camera, before this one, but for budget car work, action cam, product photography, there's a good chance this will still find its way into my bag. Now I'll leave you with some more footage to watch to help you make up your mind about this guy, if it's right for you or not. But for now, thanks so much for watching. Feel free to hit like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.